Lockheed's habit of leadership was formed more than a quarter century ago, when men made wings of fabric with nails and glue. Aviation's pioneers wrote history with those early Lockheed planes. Captain Frank Hawks, in an Air Express takeoff in 1928 from a field adjacent to the plant. Art Goebel in the Yankee Doodle. The Lindbergh, and their Sirius. The Winnie May, her pilot, Wiley Post. The Lady Southern Cross, and Kingsford Smith. Amelia Earhart, and her Vega. Public enthusiasm for flight was growing. Howard Hughes, his record-setting Model 14. Lockheed's transport experience grew from the original electric, the company's first all-metal airplane. Later came the Model 18 Lodestar, quite an advance over its predecessor. Lockheed had become a name known round the world. Commercial orders poured in. In 1938, airline executives began talking a bigger, faster plane, four-engine transport. Lockheed engineers designed a plane to match their specification. Robert Gross named it the Constellation. Before commercial production could get underway, America was plunged into World War II. Constellation was pressed into service as a military transport. Packed a hundred combat-ready troops. At war's end, eight airlines were waiting impatiently for deliveries of 73 commercial Constellations on order. PWA started passenger service early in 1946. Alert to the changing time and changing travel needs, Lockheed constantly improved the Constellation. In 1950, the Super Constellation came along to dwarf all other versions. And in 1956, another new sky giant was introduced, a Super Super Constellation called the Starliner. It has a 150-foot wingspan, 27 feet more than the Super Constellation. It brought a new concept to world travel as it joined the world's capitals in non-stop flights across whole continents and oceans. From first flight to final rollout, more than 500 of the series, serving 33 airlines, charted an aerial path round the world. A striking tribute to the soundness of the original bold design. Five products of the Constellation series were two military versions. WV-2s for the Navy, and RC-121s for the airport. Early warning aerial sentry. Connies with radar humps on their backs and radar bulges below. Still patrolling the ocean approaches to the North American continent, guarding against enemy attacks. In 1956, Lockheed leapfrogged into the future with the introduction of the WV-2E, startling in appearance with a rotating saucer on top. An augury of things to come, this flying saucer proved that larger antennas to match the growing sophistication of radar could be flown, served as a valuable test bed for the Navy. While the Connie was still at the height of its popularity, Lockheed was preparing for a new era of jet transportation. In 1954, it became the first American manufacturer to receive a turbine transport order with its prop jet electric. The new airliner was given the same name as Lockheed's first all-metal airplane. The Electra entered airline service with Eastern Airlines and American Airlines in January 1959 and won immediate acceptance. 60% of all airline passengers fly less than 500 miles, 80% less than 1,000. The Electra can fly to cities where 95% of the world's air traffic originates, large cities and small. The Electra was designed to serve the greatest number. It fits almost every airport, 
from the large metropolitan terminals to the one runway feeder line facility. It met the airline's need for a modern jet aid, short to medium range transport. It offers creature comforts, rich, smart decor. It meets the demands of airlines for low operating costs, simplified maintenance, fast baggage loading and unloading, passenger appeal, and high performance. In their first year and nine months of service, Electras carried an estimated six million passengers, flew more than four and three quarter billion passenger miles, logged more than 410,000 flight hours. Today, in the service of 13 airlines, Electras have proved that they can do the job for which they were designed with economical efficiency. With superior short runway performance, they have demonstrated that they can use close-in terminals, operate briskly, get up and go. One ANSET ANA Electra in 21 days carried 10,142 paying passengers, flew 80 round trips between Melbourne and Sydney. In one 24-hour period, a Pacific Southwest Airlines Electra made 16 flights totaling 15 and a half flight hours, carried 1,424 passengers. Electras prove a quick trip is better than a fast ride, beating hotel to hotel trip time of faster but less nimble turbojet competitors on many routes. Electras are averaging nearly 700 scheduled departures daily, one approximately every two minutes, around the clock, every day of the week. Now, this very minute, while you're watching this film, an Electra is taking off from one of the world's busy air terminals, closing the gap between cities, large and small, winning favor with commuters over the frustrations of freeway and highway travel. From Bangkok to Beirut, from Auckland to Amsterdam, the sprightly airliners cover four continents, or Eastern, American, PSA, KLM, Qantas, ANSET ANA, Cafe Pacific, National, Braniff, Western, Teal, Garuda, and Trans-Australia Airlines. While the Electra was undergoing its test program, a military version of the big airliner was taking shape. The Navy P-3V-1, designed to track down enemy submarines. Lockheed's experience in the field of anti-submarine aircraft dates back to 1938, when a Model 14 was converted into a Hudson bomber. Designed primarily for reconnaissance, the Hudson, in the service of the British RAF Coastal Command, did much to stem the U-boat threat in the early days of World War II. The rugged bomber was given the affectionate nickname Old Boomerang for its ability to return home from combat. It was the Hudson that hurtled Lockheed into mass production of aircraft. More than 3,000 were built for the British, Canada, Australia, and the United States. In 1942, a Lodestar was modified into the first Ventura with anti-submarine patrol duty as its primary mission. Production on Venturas and follow-on harpoons topped the 2000th mark, leading to design of the famed P2V Neptune series, which added the new advantages of electronics. This was the third Navy P-2V-1 Neptune. They called it the Truculent Turtle, and it won international acclaim in September 1946, when it flew from Perth, Australia, to Columbus, Ohio, 11,236 miles, non-stop in 55 hours and 17 minutes. The Turtle's feet still stands today 
as the world's non-refueled distance flight record. Since 1946, the Neptune has advanced through seven different models. It acquired more sophistication, more radar, a new tail housing magnetic devices to spot submerged submarines, tip tanks for longer range, and skis for landings on ice and snow. Ski-equipped Neptunes repeatedly have supported Navy operations during Operation Deep Freeze in the Antarctic, flying men and cargo in 100 below zero weather to remote bases day after day. Neptunes, boasting the longest lifespan of any Lockheed-built military aircraft, continue to roll off the Burbank assembly line. In addition, earlier P-2Vs are being returned to the factory for a program of extensive modification. Since World War II, more than 1,000 aircraft of the Neptune series have been produced for the U.S. Navy and nine friendly countries, representing, including spares and modifications, more than $850 million in sales. For more than 14 years, the Neptune has been king of the sub-hunters. But a new king is rising, the P-3B-1. This military version of the prop jet Electra is bigger, faster than the P-2V, houses new advanced electronic systems, has vastly superior striking power. Lockheed built the prototype with its own funds. Navy orders followed. Giving promise of carrying on the company's long service as a Navy contractor, this new model is now in production. Soon, it will take its place in the Navy arsenal, a powerful new aerial weapon patrolling our coastline, guarding against enemy attack. While the P-3V-1 marked the birth of a new generation of military aircraft, production came to an end on another model, the T-33 Jet Trainer. In production nearly 12 years, the last of 5,691 two-seat jets was delivered to the Air Force in mid-1959. Lockheed's fighter trainer experience had its beginning during World War II, when the P-38 Lightning was the scourge of our enemy. Lockheed built them in fantastic numbers, working round the clock, 18 of them every 24 hours, nearly 10,000 before the tide of battle had been turned. It was during this period that employment skyrocketed to 94,000. Rosie the Riveter came into being and shift brake was a veritable stampede. The Lightning was all that its name implied, the fastest plane of its time. But already aviation was facing up to a new challenge, jet propulsion. In 1944, Lockheed launched the Jet Age with the F-80 Shooting Star. The world's first mass production jet fighter the shooting star won the first jet air battle in Korea. When our Air Force officers needed jet training, the F-80 was modified into the two-place T-33 trainer. It earned the nickname International Jet Schoolhouse. Nine out of 10 of the world's fighter pilots cut their jet teeth flying the T-Bird. The T-2V-1 Sea Star was produced for the Navy Training Command to serve on land or at sea. The Sea Star enabled student pilots to operate on aircraft carriers under the guidance of experienced carrier pilots. The know-how gained in building the F-80 and the T-Bird led in 1949 to the two-seat fighter interceptor, the F-94, an advanced version, the F-94C Starfire, boasted a more powerful engine, more electronics, rockets in place of bullets for a more effective defense of America. And while the Starfire was fulfilling its peacetime role as guardian of our frontiers, engineers were testing new and strange aircraft shapes, seeking new and better ways to team up wings and electronics.
evaluating and testing again. Seeking answers to problems never faced before. They sought the ultimate in manned aircraft and built it in the F-104 Starfighter. Because it carried man closer to outer space than he had ever been in combat aircraft, because it was the first Mach 2 operational fighter, the F-104 was proved in more than 4,000 flights, backed up by 2 million man hours of engineering evaluation. In 1958, the Starfighter went on active duty with the Air Defense Command and the Tactical Air Command. When trouble flared up in the Far East, F-104s were dispatched to Formosa. In its first four months of service, the F-104 wrote new flight history, breaking altitude, speed, and time to climb records. On May 8, 1958, Colonel Howard Johnson piloted a starfighter to a new world altitude record, 91,243 feet. Eight days later, Major Walter Irwin set a new world speed record of 1,404 miles per hour over a measured course. And in December, Lieutenants William T. Smith and Einar Enevolsen of Larsen Air Force Base teamed up to set seven new time to climb marks. The Starfighter became the first aircraft in history to hold world records in three major categories at one time. But while the F-104 gained service experience, competitors broke its altitude and speed marks. Late in 1959, Captain Joe Jordan recaptured the altitude record. He flew the F-104 to 103,395 feet, nearly 20 miles above the Earth's surface. Setting records was only a sideline for the F-104, however. The Starfighter proved its combat competence in 1959 and again in 1960 in the Air Force's William Tell weapons meet. Shooting pilots from Larsen Air Force Base proved the superiority of the Starfighter in the 1959 meet, scoring 4,500 points out of a possible 5,000 to win the Sidewinder Missile Firing Championship. George Air Force Base pilots in the 1960 All Weapons Competition posted a phenomenally high score.
Late in 1959, F-104s of the Tactical Air Command went on duty in Europe, refueling over the Atlantic. They flew non-stop to Moron Air Base in Spain, achieved a remarkable 94% in commission rate. Foreign aviation specialists and government officials seeking a modern multi-mission fighter for the defense of their homeland came to Lockheed to fly and evaluate the F-104. First, there were representatives of the Federal Republic of Germany. They devoted more than a year to checking every phase of the starfighter's performance. Then came the Swiss, followed by the Canadians and the Dutch, then the Belgians, the Japanese, and finally the Australians. An advanced all-weather multi-mission version of the F-104 was selected over the best available fighters in the United States and Europe by West Germany, Canada, the Netherlands, Belgium, Italy and Japan to rearm their aerial defense forces. By mid-1960, two-seat trainer versions of the F-104 were flying in Germany. Defense Minister Strauss was on hand to congratulate General Joseph Kamhuber of the West German Air Force after his flight in the first German F-104 to be delivered. In little more than a year, the stub-winged starfighter was established as the standard strike and defense weapon of the free world. Our Air Force selected it to re-equip the air arm of friendly countries under the Mutual Assistance Program. At home and abroad, the F-104 production program calling for approximately 1,500 aircraft, emerged as the greatest undertaking of its kind in the annals of aviation. Traditionally, Lockheed has shown the way in advanced jet aircraft. It built the U-2, sensational high-altitude reconnaissance aircraft. Vice President Clarence L. Johnson, better known as Kelly, was the designer, heading up a unique organization, separate from, but within the California division, that has conceived, designed, and built some of Lockheed's outstanding aircraft. Even though the aircraft industry is undergoing far-reaching changes, changes in pace and product, in direction and thinking, Lockheed's habit of leadership persists. A new chapter in California Division history is being written. A new architectural products branch is pioneering a whole new line of products for the building industry. A new chapter in which machines used to stamp out airframes are being adapted to products that enhance daily living, earthbound products. Diversification is the order of the day. Scientists are probing the mysteries of the ocean, as well as those of the air and outer space. Lockheed is exploring many new fronts, building things far afield from conventional aircraft. Support equipment for products of Lockheed's missiles and space division. New and interesting products are being turned out in its plastic center. A new refuse disposal system Tomorrow, it may be standard equipment in cities all over the country. Lockheed, with a complete research laboratory and production facility, is investing heavily in the development of advanced infrared systems, including this tracking device. More and more, the emphasis is on research research at the basic and fundamental levels. At its Solar Physics Observatory, Lockheed is photographing and analyzing flares and other solar disturbances that may affect man's survival when he travels to outer space. Lockheed is conducting extensive investigations in oceanography and related areas. 
research on hydrofoils, studies of marine life. Corpuses like these may one day be used for underwater scouting. With the accent on tomorrow, Lockheed's California division has built this new research center near Stockton. The shape and design of tomorrow's Mach 3 or Mach 5 transport may be determined in this new $5 million wind tunnel. Engineers have catapulted the F-104 into the future with design of a vertical takeoff and landing version of the aircraft, incorporating lift pods having as many as eight engines each attached to the wing tips of the basic airplane. When the need rose for a dependable target to fly supersonically without a pilot, the F-104 was selected for conversion into drones. A major breakthrough in rotary wing vehicles has been made with this California division designed helicopter, suitable for military duty. Tests of this prototype have demonstrated its stability, ease of control, and mechanical simplicity. Lockheed's California division is very much in the space business. Here is a space ferry capable of transporting men and materials into orbit, equipped to work in outer space. The challenges of the future are many and awesome. There is the challenge we face to build a better America, the challenge of the sea that surrounds it, the world's last great unexplored area, and the challenge of the air and the space beyond. Lockheed, with its men, machines, ideas, and experience, having pioneered uncharted highways for nearly half a century, stands ready to face these challenges.